Welcome to the Whitney and welcome to tonight's program, Ideology, Ableism, and Capitalism, a talk by Emily Barker. My name is Megan Hoyer, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney. Uh, I'm a tall white woman with straight brown and gray hair, and I'm wearing a dark shirt, and I'm speaking to you from the Whitney's Theater with a large screen behind me. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you can access closed captioning in English or in Spanish by turning on this feature in the options bar. We also have ASL interpretation available and we're privileged to have our friends from Colectivo Babia providing live interpretation in gender inclusive Spanish and you can access that in the room or on, online. Um, if you're in the room and you'd like Spanish, um, there are headsets available in the back. Thank you so much to Bonnie for the live captioning. Thank you, Craig and Pam, our ASL interpreters. And thank you, Cristobal and Pau, for providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. Oh, and I forgot we also have Spanish captioning, um, again, in the back of the room if you'd like it or online. Um, I also want to begin by acknowledging that um, here at the Whitney, we are on the lands of the Lenape people. As a result of centuries of colonialism, today the Lenape are dispersed throughout the US and Canada. Alongside the Lenape, many other indigenous nations have ancestral ties to this place now known as New York, including the six Haudenosaunee nations, Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Mohawk, Oneida, and Onondaga, and the Shinnecock and Poopspatek, excuse me. If you are joining us online, please take a moment to identify and recognize the indigenous people who have always and continue to steward the land from where you're joining us. Okay, so I am thrilled to be introducing Emily Barker for this talk about their work in conjunction with their inclusion in the Whitney Biennial. As you may know, this edition of the Biennial has a title, Quiet As It's Kept, which is a colloquialism that the exhibition's co-curators, Adrian Edwards, and David Breslin have explained, quote, is a phrase typically said prior to something often obvious that should be kept secret. Should, of course, is a tricky word here. According to whom should something be kept a secret? This is one of the questions raised by the exhibition. Um, and I want to thank David and Adrian for putting together this incredible and thought-provoking show. It's also a question asked by many of the artists who are included, um, who offer powerful critiques of our present condition and the failings of our society in the wake of long histories of injustice. Emily Barker is one of those artists. Emily's work as both an artist and an activist addresses ableism through the built environment. Their work, Kitchen, which is on view on the fifth floor, helps us to experience how a seemingly ordinary domestic space might be a site of danger and terror depending on the body you inhabit. Quiet as it's kept, ableism is everywhere. Emily has said that their aim is to show how the seemingly mundane built environment and the mass production of objects harms people every day. That's a quote. And their talk tonight will expand on this idea and weave together many aspects of their thinking and making. Um, so a brief bio, Emily Barker is an artist and activist based in Los Angeles, California. They received a BFA from the School of the Art Institute in 2014, and in 2020 they had a solo exhibition entitled Built to Scale at Murmur's Gallery in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, for tonight's program, Emily's going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then I'll come back to share some questions from you, our audience. If you're joining us online, please put your questions in the Q&A. And if you're joining in person, there's a QR code on your seat that you can use to submit a question. Um, and one final note, a practical one, restrooms are located outside of the theater on this floor, which is the third floor of the Whitney. If you need to exit for any reason during the program, please use the doors at the back of the room where you entered. Um, thank you all so much for being with us tonight, both here in the room and online, and thank you so much to Emily for, for being with us and sharing their work. Thank the, you, Megan. The stage is yours. Thank you. They call this the smart drive. It's like 5K, and I swear to God, every day it almost pushes me into rush hour traffic. I call it the dumb drive, and I'm turning it off so I don't go flying off this 
stage if I tap my wrist. Is this? Okay, good. Um, talking about everything I want to talk about in 40 minutes is probably one of the greatest challenges I've ever faced. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of surprising given the amount of times I've almost died. Um, and uh, as you can see here, um, what the built environment may be like for someone in a wheelchair. But to introduce myself, uh, I feel like that's already taken care of. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to Adrian Edwards and David Breslin as well as the entire Whitney staff and all of my friends who helped um, with installing the pieces um, and anyone who's ever helped me in any way. There's um, not a single disabled person that doesn't rely on multiple people um, consistently throughout their lives uh, to do things that the built environment maintains we cannot. And um, also, you know, even more so than that. Um, I also want to thank all of the disabled organizers and artists who have fought for the emancipation from legal, environmental, social, and political restrictions all people face and continue to face every day. Um, personally, as an artist, I believe I have a responsibility to the viewer as well as myself to make work that is not only aesthetically and formally considered, but also as Felix Gonzalez Torres says, I want you, the viewer, to be challenged, moved, and informed. And as cultural producers, we need to be aware of what the culture is doing. The kitchen piece is a, um, is a very, very tall, I don't know exactly where we hung it, um, but it's out of reach for virtually any standing person that comes in contact with it, the top cabinets are. And the height of the bottom cabinets uh, come up to the chest on a standing person, which is how I experience counters, bars, restaurants. Um, this piece is not just a literal representation of the challenges I face trying to use my kitchen, but it's also a metaphor for the entire built environment and the way that standardization and normalization has created a, a very harsh land of obstacles for anyone who is divergent from what we consider like standard or normal. Um, and that's a lot of people. There's over 10 million wheelchair users in the world and you cannot see us because we can't participate in the built environment due to the way that it is built. So inaccessibility is a cyclical monster as how do we change things if we cannot even show up? Um, a lot of people are unwilling to do the small measures that it would take to get me into the front door of many of the buildings in um, New York and LA. But um, my work ties into this uh, constant frustration of living in a world that doesn't consider my existence and would often, I've been told literally to uh, kill myself if I am complaining about the barriers I face daily due to the built environment. Um, I should do a trigger warning. I will be talking about genocide in passing, and I will be talking about um, uh, anti-abortion uh, laws, and um, I will be talking about eugenicism and um, just general systems of oppression that I know traumatize many of the people I'm friends with daily and including myself. Um, the kitchen piece is built out of PTEG plastic, which uh, is vacuum formed over CNC molds. And I use the material that I used because it is one that I can work with physically. So I was able to cut out each piece of the cabinets myself and rivet them together because it's very hard to uh, afford to pay someone to help me do my work. So I don't have any assistance and I have one, uh, one co-collaborator, Tomas Jan Groza, who vacuums form, vacuum forms the pieces and um, we both cut them out and rivet, and I riveted them together with the team here at the Whitney, but the material choice for this piece is simply based out of necessity. 
Uh, I don't have a studio. I don't have a laptop. I'm not allowed to have more than $2,000 in my bank account or I lose my caregiving and Medicaid via the state. And a lot of people aren't very familiar with the difference between um, SSI laws and SSDI laws. But um, SSI laws are the ones that apply to children who have become disabled or young people who have become disabled and cannot work um, at least five years before their accident or disability happens. And um, we are forced into poverty to maintain our health insurance and our caregiving assistance and our rental assistance. And we have to somehow find apartments to live in that are under $675 a month um, or less, which is impossible. So many disabled people are criminalized under our current austerity laws for trying to survive. And many disabled people end up in prison because of them. Um, the kitchen is also um, a forced perspective that I would like people who can stand to understand that access isn't just about ramps and isn't just about stairs and just isn't just about entrances. Uh, I particularly hate ramps. They're very brutal. I have a lot of upper back pain. I've had like seven spine surgeries. Um, so using a wheelchair is very difficult for me. I have um, over $10,000 in electric assistive devices, and that's out of pocket. That's on top of the cost of the custom wheelchairs that you need um, that are lightweight, that are built for your body. And every person who has a spinal cord injury or is a paraplegic or quadriplegic needs a custom built wheelchair. And that spans from $27,000 to 60 or even $80,000. And oftentimes it takes three to six months to get that covered by insurance, and um, a lot of disabled people like die from pressure sores when they can't get their cushions replaced, like these uh, Rojo NASA air cushions. And um, that goes to my next piece, the cost of health insurance and medical care in the United States. Uh, this is a stack of medical billing from 2012 to 2015, and a life care plan that states the cost of me being disabled for the rest of my life out of pocket. And I, uh, my dad, I used to be on his insurance, which was like pretty not great. And um, now I'm on Medicaid and I can't even find a wheelchair repair company to repair my wheelchair under Medicaid. Um, and so this, this stack is also a metaphor of the bureaucracy and the amount of labor that comes after getting in like a terrible accident or having something bad happen to you in the US. Um, and that's, you know, sexual assault, that's anything. It's like if you're trying to work within the system as anyone who um, has been traumatized by it, you're, it's going to be a massive weight for you to deal with. And, um, the cost of, you can see on the bills, like if you look up closely, like the cost of um, a catheter is like $8 or like, a, or like an IV is like $20. So you can see each individual cost, but the first page was which someone took. <laughs> um, please don't take these. This is not a Felix Gonzalez Torres piece. <laughs> um, Somehow people are thinking that they get to take them. Please don't. But the first page has several spinal cord surgeries that were upwards of $100,000. And the total cost of my, um, of my medical history and the complications that have resulted from my accident are upwards of $2 million right now. Um, and that's just for 10 years. And um, the first three years, they wanted me to pay in 21 days $500,000 uh, myself as a 20 year old. Um, and that was after insurance had paid out premiums on the account. Uh, and this is a reality for hundreds of thousands of Americans every year. And if I had any assets, I would lose my house and my car and everything. And thankfully, I didn't have any assets because I was a teenager. But um, a lot of people don't like to think about this reality. And a lot of these things are hidden in plain sight. And I just 
this affects everyone. There isn't one person that doesn't need help in some way at some point in their life and that doesn't need medical care in some way. And we consider it a very taboo topic when this is a part of our culture and a part of our society and a part of being an American. Um, this is a very small stack. I actually could fill a piece I want to do is filling an entire room with all my medical history. Um, and I haven't made that yet because getting the the medical history is very difficult from the hospital. It takes, it's like very impossible to get. Um, and I don't know anyone who could afford the amount of medical debt that I have or the cost of the wheelchairs that I need or the cost of the, you know, transportation. I can't even get to, I'll show you the sidewalks by my house, but I cannot get to the bus stops in my neighborhood because there are no curb cuts. Um, so disabled people have to either ride in the middle of the street um, or if you have an autoimmune disease, risk your life riding the bus. Um, and uh, so I was able to thankfully fundraise or beg for money to get a lift for my truck. And that's how I get around Los Angeles. And I don't know what I would do here because I think it was Thankfully, the Whitney is reimbursing me, but it was $1,000 in lift, lift rides, accessible lifts to get to and from the museum for install for me the first week. And I don't know anyone who could afford these costs on their own. And this is the reality for millions of people, <laughs> and no one talks about it. And everyone thinks that after the ADA that sidewalks would have curb cuts or that you would be able to use the sidewalk in your house while walking your dogs. But no, I have to be in every city I've ever been in, in the middle of the street. Um, you could find me in Wall Street <laughs> trying to get to the river walk um, many days this week. Uh, this is New York. I was very surprised when I got here because LA is a little bit more considerate as far as restaurants and stores. But um, a lot of the store, like nearly every single store in Soho, except for the Alexander McQueen store, had steps. And um, Alexander McQueen had a ramp, which was nice. But this is Louis Vuitton. So, I mean, not that disabled people can afford to, you know, buy that. But I found it really interesting. Um, this, the photos are really hard to tell. But um, it's very difficult when you're using a manual wheelchair to go over the roadwork construction. And um, obviously, I had to use that curb cut. So I went under the caution sign. But I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, this is a lip that I have on here to show that people in power chairs, if I didn't have this um, scooter, wouldn't be able to make it over that curb. Um, this almost killed me earlier this week. Uh, you can't tell how steep it is in this photo, but um, it is super steep, a lot of the curb cuts that exist, and then you're getting covered in, splashed in mud. That, like, I made that splash, so I'm very proud. Um, uh, but I don't think people really recognize how the built environment is punishing people who have already <laughs> faced like so much in their lives and who can't get around in the same ways as everyone else. And um, I make a lot of work about ramps being inaccessible because it requires a lot of funding to have the, the help. But people don't consider that like manual wheelchair users have a pretty tough time getting up ramps without these expensive devices. Um, back to the kitchen piece, schools and hospitals were designed by the same people who have built prisons. So our entire built environment is like based off of like very carceral logic. And um, you see that when you're interacting in the sidewalks this way, wheelchair users are living in, you know, I, I, I can't participate or go into restaurants or bars or stores. This is like literal, like the definition of segregation. And that's a very loaded word. But I don't think that people recognize that inaccessibility is violence and that disabled people are not just me, a white person, and that so many people are facing these obstacles every day on top of whatever other intersectional marginalization they have and that it's just like not okay. 
Um, and I think we really should do something to change it. Um, ableism is inherent in our economic system. Uh, people who cannot provide labor uh, and create profits for wealthy people are, you know, can't eat, can't house themselves, um, are, are told that they should just go away somehow, um, and are, as we see in LA, are constantly just moved from one place to another if you're homeless. And, um, and many homeless people have mental disabilities and physical disabilities, and it makes a lot of sense given the fact that austerity laws maintain that you do all of these impossible requirements or you get cut off, cut off of them, and then you have no way of surviving anymore, and you don't get food stamps or anything. And it's all very carceral. Um, the entire fabric of our policies in this country um, and it's very eugenicist, like uh, Francis Galton, the father of eugenicism, came up with the idea of standards and the idea of normalcy. And he did that because he had a eugenics program um, and he thought it was the best idea to artificially produce a human race through regulating marriage and procreation, um, aimed at encouraging those physically and mentally superior to mate, <laughs> And uh, he thought it was best to just get rid of people with disabilities entirely. And we saw that in with, you know, with what Hitler did. Like we've seen this over and over again with the sterilization of disabled people. Um, we've seen this with the ways in which the US, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with ugly laws, but uh, between 1867 and 1974, like the last ugly law was uh, very recent, um, these targeted poor and disabled people. Uh, San Francisco law in 1867 deemed it illegal for any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or deformed in any way as unsightly or disgustingly object to expose himself or herself to public view. Exceptions to public exposure were acceptable only if people were subjects to demonstration to illustrate the separation of disabled from non-disabled and their need for reformation. So we can see like through the history of our laws how our ideas of disabled people have been created and our ideal ideas of uh, poor people as well. Um, charity organization society suggested that the best charity would be to investigate and counsel the people needing assistance instead of providing them with material relief. And that's just still how we do things today. We think that, oh, just like a certain amount of advice. Do you mind not taking photos anymore? Sorry, it's just really distracting for me. Um, um, the charity organization society suggested, um, and I think this is so indicative of how we treat disabled and poor people now. Oh, if we only teach them a certain amount of things to do, then they'll be able to survive the system. And it's just not true. There's just so much ignorance steeped in that logic that um, any of this has anything to do with um, a certain amount of knowledge or a certain amount of respectability. And um, when we know that we know that under certain conditions, like you cannot survive if you don't have food or if you don't have shelter and if you don't have health care. And all of these things are um, predicated on during, dealing with a certain amount of bureaucracy. And um, all disabled people I currently know are going without working wheelchairs, are going without. Um, my friend was just telling me, she lives in Brooklyn, how she just eats taquitos and whatever she can get at the BP because she can't get into any of the grocery stores or restaurants in her neighborhood. And so this is like such a larger systemic problem that people really don't want to think about. Um, and we can see through the laws, like the histories of, of our country, why no one cares because these it was literally illegal to be disabled in public until 1974. The last person was uh, put into prison for being physically disabled in public in 1974. 
So I'm so lucky to be born in 1992, the year the ADA came out into existence. But the ADA is, is a horribly faulty law that does not maintain that any of this is, doesn't exist. Um, the ADA has loads of loopholes and is basically, I, I think, like a vanity law is how I see it. Um, because without suing entire states or entire cities, which people have tried to do, you cannot change any of these things. Um, and in nice neighborhoods, there aren't curb cuts. Um, and when the sidewalks get really messed up and you hit, you can't tell in photos it like flattens it out like how steep something is. But I'm constantly being catapulted out of my wheelchair by the sidewalks in any city. Um, it doesn't matter where I'm at. And the lack of maintenance on these things is like, you know, causes needing surgeries and needing to spend thousands of dollars on medical treatment that people don't have. Um, bathrooms are also not accessible in most places. Even at my doctor's office, there's not an accessible bathroom. Um, and people just don't think about these things. Uh, because disabled people have been kept from our view for, for hundreds of years. For as long as this country has existed, we have tried to put disabled people into care homes and into, nur like into nursing homes. And before that, they were institutionalized and left to die if they had too many needs. And you can Google all of this. And I really hope that you do Google the history of disability in the United States, because I can't talk about it without like getting very upset. Um, but um, I believe that compulsory able-bodiedness is simply a symptom of this economic system that punishes you if you cannot labor to create profit for wealthier people or yourself. And that punishment is in the form of starvation and homelessness and lack of health care. Capitalism enforces health and able-bodiedness by punishing people with the incredible costs related to being sick and disabled. Many people, I can kick my legs, I'm an incomplete paraplegic, and um, I did that in an Instagram ad that was on billboards, and I got harassed for months and told that I was faking needing a wheelchair because I can move some muscles in my legs. Um, no one would be able to afford this cost. <laughs> no one would want to um, navigate the sidewalks or the built environment in a wheelchair for fun. Um, unless you're like ambulatory and you can navigate things easier. I don't know a single person who has a spinal cord injury that loves being in a wheelchair. Um, and there's also certain levels to that. But um, there's no safety net for anyone. And that means less available care for those in crisis. This is really like an overall problem because we all face health problems. We all have mental illness. We all face different oppressive systems within the society that we're living in. And all of those things put together mean that disabled people in communities don't, can't receive the care that they need because everyone is struggling to survive our economic system. And um, people don't have extra time or extra funds to take care of people in their family who are disabled or chronically ill uh, due to the conditions that we're living under. Um, for me, it's not about unlearning ableism because ableism is incentivized by our current system, which only values the profits of a worker's labor. If you cannot work because you're disabled, chronically ill, mentally ill, or not presentable enough, you are shown in many ways that you do not deserve to live because you cannot afford to. This goes even further when we learn disabled people on SSI are not allowed to legally work. These are called austerity measures, which are strict economic policies implemented by governments. Um, and disabled people cannot afford medical treatment, mobility devices, accessible homes, because we are also not allowed to earn money or have more than $2,000 in savings without losing our Medicaid and home, home caregiving services and food stamps. Um, it, the austerity programs in this country are super severe and super restrictive, and they're very different. SSDI is a completely different program than the one that I am on, and no one knows about it. Um, but you lose your access to life giving, caregiving, and medical care if you have more than $2,000 in your bank account and you're not allowed to take um, a gift of $65 or more any month. Um, so I don't know if 
could any of you live off of that? Could any of you actually survive that way? Like, would that, I'm just like curious if, if anyone's life outside of being disabled could survive under those conditions. Um, and it's very important to understand to me that people have value outside of their capacity to provide profits. And when we think that they don't, we're basically saying that poor and disabled people deserve to die and that disability, mental illness, and poverty is a character, character flaw and an individual problem, not one that is a symptom of larger societal flaws. Um, the ruling class and people who profit off of these policies and systems know what they're doing. Like there's people who have been writing and fighting for so many years. They, they, the cost that it would take to ensure healthcare or access for people with disabilities would be such a fraction of our military and police budgets. There's no good excuse for all of our tax money going to things that we don't actually need as a society. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think this all goes back to our complete devaluing of people with disabilities and chronic illnesses and the idea that, they, that it is an individual problem and not a larger societal flaw and concern. Um, and, you know, now we have a responsibility as artists, um, as we, as our whole entire planet faces climate catastrophe, genocides, racial disparity, police violence, anti-abortion and miscarriage laws, increased homelessness, rising poverty, starvation, anti-LGTBQ laws, and fascism, we... I do not think we should just be mindless creators creating more objects that um, to sell or like be vessels for capitalism. Um, I think we could do better than that. I think it's important for all of us to survive and I know that the conditions that I've lived under have meant that I don't need to sell work because I cannot. Um, and that has given me a certain amount of freedom in the work that I make. Um, but we all know from the recent IPCC report that the most powerful corporations and governments are all in bed with the fossil fuel industry. And a lot of the things that they told us that they were gonna do, they're not doing. Um, and there won't be any way to make the air breathable or the water drinkable or our planet livable once it's too late. And so I don't think we need more mindless production of objects and content. The fetishized, um, and for me, that includes the fetishization of medical objects and art. I'm very tired of seeing prosthetics uh, in art or like wheelchairs used by able-bodied artists. Um, it's called cripping up and it's a form of appropriation and we can do better than that. Um, I've seen performances where people do acrobatics over wheelchairs and I just find it like horrific to, as a person who has a spinal cord injury and cannot get around <laughs> at all. Um, it's like, do you actually understand what your community is facing? Um, what we need is material realities and conditions to change. What we need is to listen to people with the most needs. What we need is more art that's beautiful while being relevant, challenging, observant, and consider the actual world that we're living in. We can no longer risk the consequences of escaping from our realities for all of us. And here are some artists that I think have done a very good job of that, of making us face these realities and periods of time in our history that are still continuing today. Um, Felix Gonzalez Torres uh, is a Cuban American artist who died of AIDS and a lot of his work is about the loss of his lover, Ross. Um, the history of disability within art has been completely erased but modern art started with Francisco Goya becoming deaf and in his deafness and in his anxieties with his deafness, he started painting abstractly. Um, uh, my last, before I get to the last thing, this is some of my other work. This is 120 catheters, uh, which is $160 out of pocket every month. So to pee, you have to come up with that cost every single month. Um, but also, I think it's like a beautiful <laughs> sculpture of, of catheters, um, and you can only use them once. Uh, and disabled people who are poor often reuse their catheters and end up dying of kidney infections and sepsis. 
Um, so there's everything is so um, everything is so cost prohibitive. This is a piece made out of IV tubing and electrical wire to show that grass and carpet is not accessible. Um, there's a doggy bag to represent the amount of shit that I roll through on the sidewalks. Please do me a favor and pick up your dog shit. It is takes me two hours to get it off of me. Um, and it gets everywhere and on my clothes. Um, the last thing I'm going to say, this is a piece that I made. Um, I'm, uh, I have to wear contacts, but I'm very, very, I have negative seven vision, so I'm like legally blind. Um, but this piece is to create like another obstacle for readers and I'll, and I'll finish with this. But this is a piece I made in 2018 um, in the show Built to Scale at Murmurs. Um, imagine waking up and not being able to enter your home or your friends and family home, family's home or the bathroom in those spaces. Imagine finding a place you can enter and use the bathroom but not being able to use your kitchen, your dryer, your closet. Imagine not being able to use most, ba most bathrooms or see yourself in the bathroom mirrors in bathrooms you can use. Imagine not being able to physically open the door of your home or apartment building and having to wait an hour for someone to let you in. Imagine sunlight and fluorescent lighting immediately giving you a searing headache. Imagine not being able to use the sidewalk or get up your own driveway. Imagine needing someone to get you out of bed in the morning and if they don't show up, not being able to get out of bed. Imagine Imagine if you have the use of your hands needing a grabber in every room to pick up every little thing. Imagine someone moving an object from where you placed it and, never, and it never being found again. Imagine an obstacle. Imagine an obstacle created in the design of every object built into existence. Imagine a hierarchy of needs and yours never being met. Imagine going in and out of the ER in every hospital in your, of your city. Imagine going months vomiting and being too tired to move, not knowing you could have died any day due to lack of salt in your blood. Imagine having to get surgeries on all your toes to be able to wear shoes. Imagine spending the majority of your time on hold being passed around to different departments whose jobs, it seems, is to deny you the services you pay for. Death by a million paper cuts. Imagine being loved. Imagine space being built for you. Imagine being a light to those around you. Imagine being a force to be reckoned with. Imagine industrialization not stripping each object of use value because they say your body has none. And um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> and I can't believe I need to say this, but please stop calling us inspirations for trying to survive these systems. Um, we are not inspirations, we are just uh, people. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, that was really amazing. And you're right on time. Yay, <laughs> I tried. Um, you did amazing. Um, let's see. Okay. So we have some questions um, that, yeah, um, I hope we'll just help elaborate and keep going. Um, so um, Jorge asks, thank you for seeing climate catastrophe. Can you talk about the links you see between how we treat the land and how we treat disabled people? Yeah, I mean, climate catastrophe is, is like horrible for disabled people because we're the most likely to die whenever there's a fire or a flood or a hurricane. We're the least likely to be able to be evacuated in hospitals and our homes. Um, we don't care about our environment, we don't care about the planet, and we also don't care about disabled people. So it's, uh, I mean, in general, with the policies that exist currently, it's just exploitative, and we're, we're, <laughs> we're exploiting everyone, and we're exploiting this planet, and we won't have anything left if we don't stop it, and if, you know, I would love a general strike tomorrow. Um, to demand these changes so that we all can keep living here because I don't know about you, I don't want to live on Mars. I have no interest being on an ugly rock. I need to be around plants and animals and water. Um, and I don't think that that's a viable solution or something that we should be putting loads of fossil fuels into the air so Elon Musk can take fun space trips. <laughs> and Bezos, including. I can't, I can't believe that this is real. I can't believe that we're living where people are doing this to our planet. What if he spent money 
figuring out how to fix the built environment. Yeah, I mean, Jeff they, Bezos. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna. It seems Next yeah. Project. <laughs> um, yeah, we have somewhere where you can put your money. <laughs> um, okay, um, so. David asks, you mentioned Felix Gonzalez Torres, and I feel like there's more you could say about him, but also would you talk about, um, mention, and you also spoke about Goya, um, but are there any um, other artists who are really important to you and to your thinking, um, maybe now or, or as you've been, I mean, you're still a, a young artist, but. <laughs> I wish that there were like more artists that I like really that really were at this like intersection of like uh happy and healthy no I'm just kidding um uh I've spent way too much time in pharmacies uh uh (laughs) so many hours um probably years of my life um but uh not I'm I'm just as such a I went to SAIC and after my accident, I was painting before, and after my accident, it was such a struggle. I was allergic to the oil paints. I was getting oil paint everywhere, stretching canvases. I couldn't move anything below my waist, so it wasn't an option to get on the floor and stretch canvases or anything like that. And um, Felix was able to give me a light at the end of the tunnel and a way out from thinking that it was hopeless, my current physical capacity to create work because I didn't have money, I didn't have assistance. Um, and so all of my work is made in my head and I don't need anything for that or to make that work. Um, and Goya also, you know, he was a product of his time and his environment. Um, and I just think the moment, I think that he's just so important to disability art history because without him becoming deaf, we might have never seen like, or we at least wouldn't have seen abstract art in such a beautiful way. Um, I'm gonna go to one of my favorite paintings. Uh, uh, We would have never seen uh, this uh, painting on his wall in Madrid. Everyone has to go to the El Prado Museum in Madrid, it's amazing. but I'm a big fan of like classics, like Bosch, uh, Bosch and um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I wish I had more. I'm a really huge fan of authors. Like everyone should read the Society of the Spectacle, Guy Debord, um, Fanon, Walter Benjamin, um, uh, Writings on Cities, Lefebvre, I never know how to pronounce his name, and um, Graeber's The the dawn of everything. Um, Graeber, the dawn of everything. Is that what it's called? Is that what it's titled? Is like so important. Just everyone read it. The way that we, we lack so much imagination because we haven't been taught anything in school and we haven't been taught like our actual history as as human beings. We have such a limited worldview that keeps us from being able to imagine better futures for ourselves and for each other. And I think because of that, a lot of people have lost a lot of hope that they could still have. Yeah, our thinking about history is sometimes is very, um, history is actually way longer. Like if we're just talking about the last two centuries, it's like, that's like a minute. In Paleolithic terms of- <laughs> human beings, like communities would take care of disabled people and feed and house them. Like people 10,000 years ago were treating people with disabilities better than they do now. Um, okay, I, I think we have time for a couple more. So um, Karen asks um, or writes, hello, Emily, thank you for your work and voice. My question is how can disabled people like me and you get able-bodied people out of the way and out of decision-making? Oh, uh, <laughs> the fact, I mean, I'm, I, that's like the biggest problem because every single decision that an able-bodied person makes for us in the realm of art or in the realm of society means that our needs go unmet because they don't actually understand. Like they can't look at a list of, um, I, I think it starts with not being infantilized. I think it starts with demanding, um, I think being more demanding and knowing our worth. I think it's dealing with a lot of internalized ableism and, and it shocks me what my disabled friends will put up with from other people simply because they, you know, society tells us that we aren't 
worth anything. Um, and I think it's very important for people in leadership positions to start giving these roles over to people with disabilities. As we've seen with Park MacArthur, um, their curating at the Brooklyn Museum was like amazing, um, the shows there. And I think, I think disabled people were so able to solve problems in a way that other people are not because we're constantly solving so many problems every day that we've never faced before. And it's, it's honestly everyone else's loss that we're not, like, I, like if we built cities, they would be so beautiful and so elegant and so easy to navigate. Um, and the fact that developers exist that are just making money off of these horridly ugly, terrible buildings that people jump off of and that are just, it's outrageous to me that we're not in decision-making capacity simply because people think that we're children. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, wow, there's more, lots of questions are coming in. So, um, I, one I wanted to ask is, um, I just, so Andy asks, can you speak about the now overused phrase, quote, the new normal or the idea of a, quote, post-pandemic world? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you think that COVID has helped reframe how we think about systems around chronic illness and disability. I've seen so many disabled people die from lack of medical care due to the ignorance and bigotry that exists in this country, including my anti-vaxxing own parents who have given me COVID. I have seen... <laughs> like a lot of this I can barely talk about because it makes me so upset. Um, but yeah, COVID's great in the fact that we're talking about this now and it seems to be important chronic illness because so many people are getting them. But I've dealt with a, I didn't even get to talk about the fact that I live with the most painful autoimmune disease in existence because I'm so concerned with the material realities of the built environment and how messed up they are. And I go every day living in like a severe amount of pain um, because everything else, just doing anything is like so difficult. Um, I don't think there's a new normal. Uh, I still don't think people care about each other in the ways that they should. And um, it's ridiculous that we're having so many new strains due to like the lack of vaccination in this country. And so many people are dying because of it. And so many people die because of like the negligence of airlines um, and Gracia Garcia, a disability activist died because United Airlines totaled her wheelchair. And um, she wasn't, and we rely on these very expensive, very specific custom made chairs and cushions so that we don't get pressure sores. And she died of a pressure sore this past year due to the negligence of, a, of an airline and her insurance company combined. I don't, I don't think that there's a, I don't think that we should be commuting and going back to work and that doesn't, in, in office buildings, that doesn't make any sense. Um, given the fact like how nice LA was, the air, um, and the fact that gas is now $7 a gallon, to expect people who are making $15 an hour, or in some states, $8 an hour, to spend so much on gas to go to work. It's just everything is nuts for everyone, not just disabled people. Okay, sorry, I'm just reading all these amazing yeah. questions, but wondering if um, maybe a good way to, for us to wrap up is to have you talk about um, some of the things that you're working on, because I think they're really amazing, and like you have some really beautiful things brewing. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do that, or do you uh, want to sure. take another question? Uh, okay. or all, if any of them seemed really good to you, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm building an RV right now because I can't afford rent anywhere. Um, so I've been building out a 36 by 7 foot wide RV with grant money. Um, and it's called Moving Parts, and I hope it becomes a part of a museum show one day as well uh, because it builds an environment that's way more beautiful than any apartment I've been in that would work for really anyone. Um, and my nose is running because I'm emotional, not because I'm like anything. It's just talking about this is very, very difficult. And even though I've dealt with these things now for 10 years, it never becomes easier. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm uh, hoping to build an RV, or I have built most of it out. Um, and now it's just the furniture aspect. But uh, I really would like to start building accessible homes and designing them for people with disabilities that are, that are very, very affordable. 
Um, and I want to start with homes that are under $40,000. So, uh, and that people would be able to pay their SSI per month to own it. So then they would get to own it because disabled people right now can't own anything. Um, and um, I have many pieces that are already built that are vacuum formed. And, um, and I don't want to talk about them because I've been ripped off so much already with the with the first show that I did, like I've seen the same like language, like the same sentences go around so much now that I don't, I don't want to talk about the pieces I've, I've made, but they're more devastating, I would say, than the ones that you saw emotionally devastating and more, and more beautiful in my opinion, which is very important to me. I don't think that you should have to make compromises with aesthetic and formal values um, just because you have something to talk about. I think you make that point very well. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah, I think that that's like a perfect note to end on, really. You don't thank make compromises. You. Megan has <laughs> helped me all week with like everything for the past two weeks and has just been so amazing and helpful. So, and my two friends here, Angie and Courtney, have been my like best friends since before my accident when I was 17. And so it's just wonderful to have everyone here. Well, and congratulations to you, you on your inclusion in the biennial, and thank you so much for being with us and sharing all your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, and your brilliance. <laughs>